What a week! Israel is accused by pro-Hamas extremists of genocide, and the United States is accused of greenlighting said genocide. What's up with the bigotry against college female basketball star Caitlin Clark? America's most famous double murderer is dead. A sitcom actress claims Trump will put black people in camps if he's reelected. A Biden fundraiser raises a record amount of money until a few days later, a Trump fundraiser breaks Biden's record. And Trump explains his position on abortion. All of that and more. Welcome to We've Got a Country to Save, brought to you by my friends at investwirefi.com. Invest in America like I do, and by Freedom Chat. Speak freely and message privately with Freedom Chat. Download the app today and subscribe to my channel at Larry Elder for exclusive posts and never-before-seen content. We also want to thank Epic Times, Old Glory Bank, Patriot Mobile, and Birch Gold. Now, I'm old enough to remember when a protest like this, you know, the one that shut down the Senate cafeteria, was called Insurrection. Children are starving in Gaza. Children are starving in Gaza. People are dying in Gaza. People are dying in Gaza. People are dying in Gaza. And the occupation. about Israel's so-called genocide. Secretary Austin, thank you for acknowledging in response to Senator Wicker that uh, Hamas committed war crimes on October 7th and has been committing them every day since by using human shields. Um, I want to address what the protesters raised earlier. Uh, Is Israel committing genocide in Gaza? Uh, Senator Cotton, we don't have any evidence of genocide uh, being uh, created. uh, so that's a, that's a no. Israel's not committing genocide in Gaza. Uh, we don't have evidence of that, to Thank my you. knowledge. Yeah. Better than Director Burns and Director Haynes did last year, last month at the Intelligence Committee when they dodged that question. About the accusation that America is greenlighting genocide. Uh, what I would say, uh, Senator Cotton, from the very beginning is that we uh, committed to help uh, assist uh, in, uh, Israel in defending its, uh, uh, its territory and its people by providing security assistance. And I would remind everybody that, you know, what happened on uh, October 7th was absolutely horrible. Uh, And, uh, you know, uh, numbers of of, uh, of, uh, Israeli citizens uh, um, killed, uh, and then um, a couple of hundred uh, Israeli citizens uh, taken hostage. American citizens as well. American citizens as well. So so you deny the accusation that you greenlit genocide? I, I absolutely do not. Okay. About the demand that Israel give aid in the middle of a war to the combatant that started the war? We did provide aid to uh, and assistance to many of the countries that we've operated in recently. As but not we... in World War II. If you had been in George Marshall's or Dwight Eisenhower's position in World War II, would you have wanted to provide aid to Germany? I, I, I really do believe, Senator, that if they want to create a, a lasting uh, effect in, in terms of uh, stability, then I think that uh, something needs to be done to account uh, to, uh, to help uh, the, the Palestinian people. I get, yeah. I, I get that, but they're in the middle of the war. Like we, we believe that too after World War II. That's why we had the Marshall Plan. That's why we rebuilt Japan. But that was after the war was won, not in the middle of it. And in it, the meantime, like if, it's, it's not Israel's responsibility to provide aid. It's certainly not our responsibility, but we're spending t- our tax dollars to build this giant pier to send aid into Gaza. Who's going to accept that aid? Who's going to be at the end of the pier on the shore taking aid from American forces? It, that's, that's still uh, being worked out, but there, there will be uh, uh, NGOs that, uh, that, that will help to distribute that but aid. Not, uh, that Hamas is in charge of Gaza. When aid goes to Gaza, Hamas doesn't divert it or commandeer it or steal it. It accepts it. And anybody operating in Gaza is under the thumb of Hamas. I, I just think it's very ill-considered. What makes Y-Refi so different from other investments? Let's quickly break it down. Y-Refi offers a secured, collateralized portfolio with a strong fixed rate of return, up to 10.25%. 
There's no attack on your principal. If you ever need your money back, you can get it back. You are in control. You can let your investment compound daily or take income, whatever you choose. There are absolutely no fees, and an investment in Y-Refi is an investment in America's future. Simply call 888-Y-REFI-24. That's 888-Y-REFI-24. And when you call, you will not get a sales pitch. Just the info you need to see if Y-REFI is a better option for you. Or log on to investyrefi.com. That's invest, the letter Y, then R-E-F-Y.com. And make sure you tell them that Larry Elder sent you. About the allegation that Israel is committing genocide due to the large number of Palestinian civilians killed by the Israelis, Coleman Hughes dropped some truth on Joe Rogan. When you're killing 30,000 innocent civilians in response to something that killed 1,200 innocent civilians and you're continuing to bomb an area into oblivion, mm. which is what it looks like mm. when you're looking at Gaza, there's many people that have made the argument that that is at least the steps of genocide or a form of genocide. You're, you're destroying thousands and thousands of people's homes and, and killing them. So when you say 30,000 civilians, it's not 30,000 civilians that have been killed, though. How many th thousands have been killed? So according to ha uh, Gaza Health Ministry, which mm -hmm. is it is run by Hamas, the number they have is 32,000, but they don't distinguish between Hamas and civilians. How so, many members of Hamas are there? 40, 50, uh, 40,000, something like that. It's, I don't think the number is known, but it's tens of thousands. So ha Hamas says 32,000 people have been killed, mm -hmm. civilians and soldiers. Israel says 13,000 soldiers have been killed by Israel. So okay. if you just being, let's not doubt either number. They could both be well, inflated. But, like, but, but if th both of those numbers are accurate, which they may or may not be, that would be 13,000 soldiers killed, 19,000 civilians killed, mm -hmm. which for urban combat in the Middle East is a very normal ratio. I, can see, if, if, I see what you you're saying if you wanted to look at it cold and objectively. Yeah, but well, I don't. I don't. Still, I hope it doesn't come across cold because. But it's mostly women and children that are dying. That are that are dying because they're in a place where these terrorists are. Right. I mean, this is. It's not Be because the terrorists on purpose embed themselves with the civilian population, right. which is a war crime. Right. Which is a strategy that they have clearly employed. When yeah. you see them, and when when the IDF went into that hospital and found uh, the Hamas just and, recently. Yes. Yeah. So it's real. It's not just a conspiracy theory. We know that that's real. Because, and I know Kurt would probably say I'm, I'm, I'm doing the tragedy of war thing, but it's actually a legitimate point in every single war, even the just ones. There are war crimes by berserk soldiers, by the good guys. Yeah. That doesn't mean it's genocide, and that doesn't mean it's not a just war. And I think that the fundamental difference between Israel and Hamas is Israeli society, however imperfectly is not going to celebrate the monsters on their own side when they're really found to be monsters. That's they're not gonna point. they're not gonna hand out candies to people who kill Palestinian civilians like Hamas does. Um, in, in reverse. And so my feeling about it is still that, you know, any nation that suffered what Israel did on October seventh, everyone in the country would be saying you have to go get these guys. You have to eliminate this organization that did this. And if they're and they're eighty percent finished with that job, it would make no sense at this point to stop before you've cut out the last twenty percent of the cancer or before you've put out the last twenty percent of the fire, right? E even with all of the absolute suffering that is real on the Palestinian side, you know, so that that's how I feel about it. and I, I think it's really it's very, very distinct from genocide, because genocide is when you're trying to maximize civilian casualties. I think Israel, however imperfectly, is doing the opposite. They're trying to minimize civilian casualties. That's interesting. Hamas is the one that turns these civilian locations into military operation sites, Yeah, which is a war crime. It's, it's impossible. Like this is the way I would put it, succinctly. If you ask the question, what is unique about this war? What is different about this war than all other, other wars? It's, it's not the civilian death toll. The, the ratio of combatants to civilians is, I think it's better than the American armies was when we got ISIS out of Mosul. That was like 10,000 civilians dead to kill 4,000 ISIS. This is 19,000 civilians dead to kill 13,000. What's, what's unique about this war, unlike every other war that I could think of, is, is you have a, an army in Hamas that has perfected 
the art of embedding itself and meshing itself with civilians so that you cannot hit them without hitting the people around them. Other armies have done this, but none have perfected it to the extent that Hamas has. No army that I know of in, in military history has had 15 years to build 300 miles of tunnel underneath a city that they don't use to shelter the civilians, but they use to shelter themselves so that they can operate right under a kindergarten, right under a mosque. So this is a challenge no army has faced. And so that, that's what makes this war different. And, and yes, the, the, I agree with all of the, the absolute tragedy and suffering of the Palestinian people, but it's what, what creates that is the way Hamas fights. Can we live in a world where we allow that to be an acceptable strategy? I don't think so. And it's very, it's very ugly to watch. It's, it's heartbreaking, and I completely understand why people don't think the way I think when they see the videos. I completely get it. But I don't think we can actually live in a world where that's allowed to be a, a strategy. I appreciate your perspective. Yeah. I see what you're saying. Yeah. Um, you clearly know more about it than I do. As to the Israel-Hamas war, Looks like Biden has lost. Chris, don't call me Fredo Cuomo. President Biden, you're treating the war against Israel as if it were another political point of compromise. This is wrong, but this is wrong. And we need to do better here. And there has to be change and blah, 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 ceasefire. A lot of words, a lot of conditional language, a lot of half speak, a lot of appeasement in a situation that is not about balance. It is about realities. There is a primary reality, okay? And we seem to have forgotten it. Hamas is a terror organization. You designated them as that. They stole people. They need to give the people they stole back to us, to Israel, first. The hostages have become an afterthought. Every time you speak about what must happen, and you do not begin with, hey, terrorists, give back who you stole, you are giving terrorists a pass. Meanwhile, in Dearborn, Michigan. Gaza has shown the entire world why these protests are so anti-America. Because it's the United States government that provides the funds for all of the atrocities that we just heard about. And this is why Imam Khomeini, who declared the International Day of Quds, this is why he would say to pour all of your all of your chants and all of your shouts upon the head of America. Malcolm X said, and I quote, we live in one of the rottenest countries that, have ever, that has ever existed on this earth. It's not genocide Joe that has to go. It's the entire system that has to go. Any system that would allow such atrocities and such devilry to, a ha to happen and would support it, such a system does not deserve to exist on God's earth. And so when these fools ask us if Israel has the right to exist, the chant death to Israel has become the most logical chant Shout it across the world today. Imam Khomeini recognized that Israel is an evil settler colonialist project. He realized it is a cancer and he established this day. Israel before this, brothers and sisters, was a sacred cow. Nobody could criticize Israel. Everybody was terrified of being anti-Semitic. Everybody was afraid of them. But now the people of conscience very openly will criticize Israel. They recognize Israel for what it is. Israel is ISIS. Israel are, they are Nazis. They are fascists. They are racist. The people of the world now know this. Free, free Palestine. Free, free Palestine. From the river to the sea, Palestine will be free. Palestine will be free. Now, this Palestinian American, who no doubt thinks of himself as a moderate, sees things a bit differently. The rhetoric that has been coming out of the Biden administration, that's been coming out of the White House, it's frustrated a lot of people, especially people who are Palestinian Americans, Muslim Americans, Arab Americans. We are not satisfied with what has taken place. There has been no concrete steps. 
But keep in mind, we're very concerned about the people that are over in the Gaza Strip that are in Palestine right now, who are not just starving, but are facing the threat of a looming Rafah invasion. And so I was able to share that with the president and let him know that out of respect for my community, out of respect for all of the people who have suffered and who have been killed in the process, I need to walk out of the meeting. And I want to walk out uh, with decision makers and let them know what it feels like uh, for somebody to say something and then walk away from them and not hear them out and not hear their response. Wow. I mean, what did, how did President Biden respond to that? You know, there wasn't a lot of response. He actually said that he understood. And I walked away. And I think, you know, for me, just like many of the other Palestinian Americans and Palestinians, or as I mentioned, many of the people who are interested in what's going on, we're panicking. Now, Robert Spencer, who I've had the pleasure of interviewing a few times, had this to say about so-called Muslim moderates. He says, there are Muslim moderates, but there's no such thing as moderate Islam. The fact is, people have been asking me yesterday and today, as well as at pretty much everywhere else that I speak, uh, what uh, can we do to encourage the moderates? And I've got to tell you that there are moderate Muslims, but there is no moderate Islam. That is an unpleasant fact, but it is a fact, and I'll explain. Now, moderate Muslims, people usually assume that that means Muslims who believe different things from the jihadis, that they don't believe that it is part of their religious responsibility to wage war against unbelievers. They don't believe that they should hate Jews and kill them. They don't believe that they should subjugate women and non-Muslims as inferiors in the society under an institutionalized system of discrimination and harassment. There is actually no such Islam. People talk in the West and they take advantage of our ignorance about Islam to mislead people into complacency. I'll give you an example. There is a 512-page fatwa against terrorism by a Pakistani Islamic theologian named Muhammad Tahir al-Qadri. And about five or ten times a day, Muslims write to me and they say, you say Islam is not a religion of peace, you should read Tahir al-Qadri. So I did. And luckily, you know, it's the wonders of the internet age, I was able to get a PDF and search it. And so what I did was I searched it for the Quran passages that exhort Muslims to commit violence and wage war against unbelievers. Because if he's really going to be presenting an alternative form of Islam, then it would be just commonsensical, would it not, for him to take up those passages and explain why Muslims should not take them as marching orders today. And I searched for chapter 9, verse 5, slay them wherever you find them. Chapter 4, verse 89, slay them wherever you find them. Chapter 2, verse 191, slay them wherever you find them. Chapter 9, verse 29, fight against the Jews and the Christians until they're subjugated and pay the tax. Chapter 47, verse 4, when you meet the unbelievers, strike at their necks, behead them. And others of that kind. 512 pages, he never mentioned any of those verses. Now, do you understand the implications of that? This is supposed to be a piece saying that terrorism is wrong and Muslims should not engage in it, and he never addressed any of the justifications that the jihad terrorists use to show that what they're doing is Islamically correct. That's not a reform kind of Islam. That's not a moderate Islam. That's a big, extensive, elaborate effort to deceive unbelievers and make us ignorant and complacent about the jihad threat. You cannot reform something, you cannot fix a problem without acknowledging that there's a problem, you see. And there is no moderate Islam. There is no version of Islam that does not teach warfare against unbelievers and their subjugation. It's just like this. This does not mean, as Raymond and Bruce were saying, that all Muslims are doing this or all Muslims are even on board with this. But it's just like in the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church teaches as part of its official teaching from the Pope and so on, Contraception is wrong. Contraception is immoral. Don't contracept. <laughs> survey after survey shows that 70, 80, 90 percent of Catholics use contraception. Now, we would be absolutely wrong, incorrect, to say that, oh, that means that the church doesn't really teach that contraception is wrong. It really does. It's just that most Catholics don't pay attention. Islam really teaches warfare against unbelievers. A lot of Muslims don't pay attention. That's just great. The problem is they have no theological leg to stand on in Islam, and therefore when they're challenged by the jihadis, and even when their children are recruited by the jihadis, they don't have any answer. 
the thing is, people have a lot of influences in their lives. Many of you have a religion, but you also have other perspectives, other priorities, other beliefs, and all of these things are complicated in everybody's heart and soul and mind. So that you have a spectrum of belief, knowledge, and fervor. Some people are very knowledgeable and very devout, whatever their religion may be, and some people bear the name of the religion, but they couldn't care less, or they don't know, or they're just more interested in something else. That's what moderate Muslims really are. They are people who just want to live their lives. If you talk about Muslims who are aware that the, that the Quran and the example of Muhammad and Islamic law all teach warfare and conquest and subjugation of unbelievers, and who reject that, and who say that must not be done, you're talking about maybe five or ten people. <laughs> I mean worldwide, out of 1.6 billion. <laughs> Zudi Jasser and his friend. <laughs> if you want to talk about <laughs> actual Muslim reformers, it is exactly that way. But if you want to talk about Muslims who just aren't going to take up arms against us at any time, well, that's millions upon millions of people. The problem is, when the chips are down, where will they side? They will side with the Muslims who are waging war. That is where their allegiance is. They probably won't do anything, but to base our foreign policy and our domestic policy, our immigration policy, to base the future of our nation, to base our children's lives on the idea that the vast majority of Muslims don't want to do this, don't care about jihad and conquest and subjugation, and that somehow some large group of Muslims who are moderates are going to rise up and fight against the jihadis and stop them, that is not only foolish, that is suicidal. Again, this is not complicated. I stand with Bibi. I want to make clear Israel's position regarding a ceasefire. Just as the United States would not agree to a ceasefire after the bombing of Pearl Harbor or after the terrorist attack of 9-11, Israel will not agree to a cessation of hostilities with Hamas after the horrific attacks of October 7th. Calls for a ceasefire are calls for Israel to surrender to Hamas, to surrender to terrorism, to surrender to barbarism. That will not happen. Ladies and gentlemen, the Bible says that there is a time for peace and a time for war. This is a time for war, a war for our common future. If Hamas and other terror groups lay down their arms, there would be peace. If Israel laid down its arms, there would be genocide. Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Any questions? Let me ask you a question. How many of you are concerned about the invasion of privacy that is currently going on by the Biden administration? Biden's DOJ is invading individuals' private messages and targeting them based on their political affiliation, and that's why I partnered with Freedom Chat, a private social messaging app that, like me, believes privacy is your fundamental human right. Freedom Chat has variable end-to-end -end encryption, built-in screenshot protection, no storage of messages on their servers, and no commercial use of user data. I'm such a fan of Freedom Chat, in fact, that I have created my own private channel that you can subscribe to for exclusive content, including never-seen images, videos, and posts. Simply download the app, or if you're on Android, join their waitlist. Search for my channel and subscribe. No one can see the channels that you are subscribed to or the posts that you react to. It's your own perfectly curated private news feed. Speak freely and message privately with Freedom Chat. Again, Download the app today and subscribe to my channel at Larry Elder for exclusive posts and never for seen content. Okay, what's the deal with hating on star college basketball player Caitlin Clark? Two things. First, just flat out, good old fashioned jealousy. Okay, a couple hours away from uh, Iowa, South Carolina, Caitlin Clark, Gabby Marshall, Hannah Stokey Company, uh, taking on the undefeated South Carolina team. Going to be a huge game, great game, probably the most. Uh, watch college basketball game women's of all time the amount of hatred that Caitlin Clark is getting not from like average people average fans like myself who got captivated by her and the way she played and for two years have followed her journey and who has elevated women's hoop to a level nobody could ever imagine this quickly I'm instead talking about former players talking heads 
race baiters. Jameel Hill, race baiter, says the only reason she's getting this coverage, she's white. Um, every UConn basketball player, Don, Diana Taurasi. You can make an argument for Paige. I'm taking Paige. Next question. So you get the number one pick this year, you would take Paige over Caitlin? Absolutely. Um, who, Brianna uh, Chicken Fry. No, Brianna Miller, Brianna... The one who's won all the titles. Um, does Caitlin Clark need a championship to be considered one of the greats in women's college basketball history? Yeah, she does. <laughs> I think so. Jeannie Ar Ariyama. Nobody wants to give this girl her flowers. Caitlin Clark. Listen, are you people stupid? Jason Williams saying you can't be an all-time great till you win a title, even though she's on a team that isn't as talented as 90% of her competition. I am I am unwilling, and maybe it's more the, the Kobe mentorship around me, to say that she is great yet. How stupid are these other women, though? How dumb, how hating are they? What about the woman who was at some press conference? I guess she was like the all-time leading scorer back in the days of uh, black and white TV and horse and buggy. So like, my record didn't get broken because I played with a man's ball. We didn't have a three-point line. I'll just go ahead and get the elephant out of the room. Uh, I don't think my record has been broken uh, because you can't duplicate what you're not duplicating. So unless you come with a men's basketball and a two-point shot, hey, you know. It's not our fault you're 100 years old. She broke your record. But more importantly, how dumb are these other WNBA players who are crying? Oh, Caitlin, why is she getting off? She's elevating your game. Yeah, I know. She has a Gatorade commercial. State Farm. She's the face of the game. She's going to make tens of millions on endorsement. I offered her $10 million to play in my rec league because she puts ass in seats. People want to watch her. How don't you get that's elevating all of you? All of you that nobody really cared about. It's elevating you to a stratosphere. Take advantage of it. We watch Caitlin play. We see you play. If you're great, these games are great. We keep watching. Your paycheck goes up. Everyone makes money. Instead, you're hating her and ripping it down. It's pathetic. It's pathetic wins. Not just black, white. It's jealousy. It's, it's woman on woman crime. It's jealousy. UConn, and I'm rooting for the men, but you, UConn women, shut up. Give her her flowers. She's helping you. More people are watching her than ever watched you. So shut up and root for greatness. It's helping the whole game. Wake up. What? To be considered great, you must win a title in a team sport? So Hank Aaron, who never played on a team that won a World Series, was not great? Elgin Baylor, who never played on a team that won a championship, was not great? Patrick Ewing? Dominic Wilkins? Charles Barkley? Speaking of whom, Sir Charles once said this. Robert Ory is on next hour. We uh, asked the question, whose career would you want? Basketball career. Robert Ory's or yours? You know, uh, I like my career. I know I didn't win a championship, and I'm, I, love, I like being myself. I, 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 I always laugh when it, I'm not sure how I got to the point where it became an individual thing instead of a team thing. Um, unfortunately, uh, a couple of people on television started this probably, and it, it actually been for the detriment of the NBA, uh, because nobody told Michael Jordan after four or five years, you got to get out of here. You're not going to win a championship. So things started getting crazy with LeBron and he started listening to all the rumors about, man, you, you got to win to be successful. And then he went, went to Miami and then it, it then it happened next with KD. Uh, so it started somewhere back then. But, hey, man, I, I'm pretty happy with my life. I wish I could have won a championship for these people here in Phoenix. Uh, but it, I don't – I'm I'm good with my, my success in my career. Now, for you non-basketball fans, Robert Ory, the person to whom Charles Barkley referred, won a bunch of titles. He wasn't nearly the player that Barkley was. So therefore, Robert Ory was a greater player than Barkley in a team sport? This ain't golf. This ain't tennis. That's just stupid. The second reason people are hating on Caitlin Clark is anti-white bigotry. Remember this. It starts because an unsophisticated Dennis Rodman is asked about Larry Bird. And let's be real. It's probably the first time in Dennis Rodman's life that a white guy 
tuned him up on the basketball court. Dennis Rodman just went to Larry Bird University. Larry Bird was the god in the NBA. You know, he's like a, the great white hope. And I said, if Larry was a black guy, he was, he'd just be a regular old, regular old basketball player. And I didn't realize what I said, you know. And someone ran over with that comment and asked Isaiah Thomas, your teammate said something. Do you agree with it? A very, very good basketball player. I think he's an exceptional talent. But I'd have to agree with Rodman. If he was black, he'd be just another good guy. <laughs> just need three tries. Are you sure? That's all you need? Yeah. All right, let's go. <laughs> One of us definitely not going home tonight. Ah! Man, you were almost there. Almost there, Billy. I was with you on that one. Damn. Come on, baby. You can do this. He's a sucker, man. Is this regulation? This ain't regulation. Oh, get the f out of here. Regulation? Yo, move, move out the way, man. I'll check it for you. Move. Move out the way. Yeah, yeah. That's about right. Let's go, baby. You can do it. Come on, I believe in you. I have faith. I know what the problem is. Come on. Come on. Now, Bird handled it with class, and it appears that Caitlin Clark is doing the same thing as well. You set me up. Look, look, look. look, look. Raymond, okay. Raymond. Now, I see you hustle, man. Hey, I ain't never used no goofy white mother like that. Hey, who oh, you calling Raymond. goofy white mother? You, you okay, goofy man, white that's... mother. Go. I guess Larry Bird was a failure in college basketball because he did not win the championship in that big title game against Michigan State featuring Magic Johnson, right? Those are just rumors, Brian, just rumors. Right. Gentlemen, congratulations, yeah. Super Bowl game. Let's go back to Dick. Okay, Brian. Then another white female college player named Paige Beckers got hated on. This former player, who is black, is doing commentary and somehow thinks she's flattering another female commentator who is white, who used to be a basketball player, by comparing her to Paige Beckers, because the white commentator, like Paige Beckers, quotes, understands her white privilege, close quote. Whatever that means. Paige Beckers! Us as black women, Paige reminds me a lot of you. Like, you say you're not really about me. And she knows, and she knows how her privilege has gotten her to that point. And also, like, she's good at basketball, obviously. But, like, she understands her privilege and, yeah. like, pushes her over the top in a sense. Opie Taylor, Opie, oh, on, hey, oh, I got on, your Opie, you, you big you bad Gomer Pyle, droopy eyed son of a. You and want the cream and wheat man, take your ass back to Mayberry. Did you see that? Us as black women, Paige reminds me a lot of you. Like you say, it's not really about me. She knows, and she knows how her privilege has gotten her to that point. And also, she's good at basketball. Obviously, she understands her privilege. It's like what pushes her over the top in a sense. It reminds me a lot of you. And I mean that as a compliment. <laughs> End of quote. <laughs> How do you think I look in this T-shirt? I'm trying to get you to say you look brilliant. You look really nice. That's what I, they mean by fishing for a compliment. What was that all about? See, the thing is, you guys look at me. You see the backwards hat, the uh, gray socks, the funky outfit, and you say, now this guy's a chump. Am I right? No. Indeed. I, I'm Oh, exactly. Can we just lighten up on this race stuff just a little bit? You're a public figure, and you're one of those public figures who... Did you say... No, I said, <laughs> I said a public oh, figure. I've got you. I've got you. <laughs> I've got you. I've got you. I've got you. I've got you say you're a public... <laughs> How about we move on? Can we, can we all get along? Can we, can we get along? There's a very common sense reason gold is pushing to all-time highs right now. Actually, there are several reasons. The cost of goods continues to rise despite interest rate controls by the Fed. Since January 21, cost of living up 17.9%. The national debt continues to skyrocket, now above $34 trillion, causing many to worry when the house of cars will come crashing down. A presidential election year that will have massive implications on the future of this country— all of this adds up to instability and uncertainty, and that is why so many Americans are turning to Birch Gold Group. Have you diversified your savings yet? Secure a portion of them with gold from Birch Gold. 
Visit LarryForGold.com and get your free info kit. You'll learn how to convert an existing IRA or 401k into a tax-sheltered IRA in gold. And it doesn't cost you a penny out of pocket. With an A-plus rating with the BBB and tens of thousands of happy customers, you can count on Birch Gold, too. Just visit LarryForGold.com to claim your free info kit and to protect your savings from uncertainty today. I will be brief. O.J. Simpson has died. At the risk of my sounding mean-spirited, let me just say this. Ron and Nicole were unavailable for comment. Man, that's just me. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. Am I wrong? You're not wrong, Walter. You're just an asshole. Okay, then. <laughs> I mean, the man did everything but leave his business card at the crime scene. And years after the murders, a documentary filmmaker interviewed one of the jurors, a black woman named Cassie Bess. Want to know why she found Simpson not guilty? Do you think that they're members of the jury? that voted to acquit O.J. because of Rodney King? Yes. You do? Yes. How many of you think felt that way? Oh, probably 90% of us. 90%? Did you feel that way? Yes. That was payback? Uh-huh. You think that's right? Do you think that was right? Whatever. Can we now revisit Johnny Cochran's closing argument, or at least my version of it? Now, 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 some of you are saying, uh, now wait a minute, wait a minute, where was OJ? Where was OJ during that 70 minute spot? Uh, and, and didn't his wife Nicole predict he'd kill her? Now, and, 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 and what about all the blood? That bloody trail leading from the scene up to, into, and on the Bronco. And what about that cap with that African-American hair in it? What about the footprints? What about the limo driver and him seeing that black hulking figure going across the grass? Some people think it might be O.J. I'm not saying it don't look bad, but let me respond to that two ways. Mark Furman. Now, now, <laughs> now, this trial is not about O.J. Simpson. This trial is not about Detective Philip Van Etter. This trial is not about Detective Mark Furman, those twins of deception, that diabolical duo, those masters of disaster. This trial's about Hitler. This trial's about Stalin. This trial's about Mussolini. This trial's about Genghis Khan. This trial's about Shaka Khan. Uh, 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 Confucius, Confucius say, man who keeps his head when all others lose theirs will be the only one to require a haircut. Think about it. Think about it. Think about it. This trial is about a black man who deigned to cross the color line and marry a white woman. Now, I know what you're thinking. I know what some of y'all are thinking. What, 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 Johnny, don't you have a white woman? Now, haven't you been going out with a white woman? And, 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 and you've been able to amass a fortune of between five, six million dollars? How come the white man ain't stopped you? A fair question. I'm happy you asked that. Let me respond to that two ways. Mark Furman. Now, 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 do the right thing. Keep your eyes on the prize. Hakuna Matata. Louie Louie. Supercalifragilisticexpialidocious. Hold the pickles. Hold the lettuce. Special orders do not upset us. Bop, bop, ba loo, bam, ba lamb, bam, boom. Tutti fruity. Oh, Rudy. Think about it. Think about it. We black people... We know, <laughs> we know, <laughs> we know about racism. We deal with racism every day. Every single day we deal with racism. Every hour, every minute, every second, yesterday, today, tomorrow. I first dealt with racism in the uterus. I deal with it in the grave, from the womb to the tomb. Now, now the Bible tells us he who covers up a crime involving a double-edged knife with a white bronco wearing a knit cap shall be denied interest to the gates of Rockingham. Can I get an amen? This is from the book of John, Shaft. This is a great country. This is a great country. It's got a great constitution. Country full of racists, but, but they're great racists. We don't have no jive racists here. We got, we got great racists. The founding fathers. They was, they was great racists. They was, they was Jefferson. 
There was, there was Washington. There was Madison. There was Ben Franklin. There was Aretha Franklin. There was John Adams. There was Samuel Adams. There was Budweiser. There was Labatt's. There was Michelob. There was Coors Light. Think about it. Think about it. Now, so I say to you, this trial is not about O.J. Simpson. This trial is not contrary to what the prosecution might want you to believe. It ain't a crusade against the white man. They some good white people. They dead, but when they was alive, they was good. And, 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 and ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it is time for the white man to wake up, get up, get dressed, get ready, and get the hell out of town. I don't care where he go. He can go to Canada. He can go to Mexico. He can go to Euro Disney. I just want him to go. Now, no OJ, no OJ. OJ, Lodi, Lodi, ain't no way. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen things. See, I got mine. I got mine. I drive a Rolls Royce to work every day. I own two, three Jaguars. I got beachfront property in Marina Del Rey, and I got a white woman on the side. I got mine. That ain't the issue. I've been to the mountaintop. I've seen things. I may not get there with you, but I've seen things. Thine eyes have seen the coming of the glory of the Lord. Free at last, free at last. Grab Mark Furman and kick his Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Amen. 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 Not guilty, indeed. Americans have had about enough of supporting companies that hate our values. Tired of compromise? Well, it's time to switch to Patriot Mobile, America's only Christian conservative wireless provider. They are an example of putting the cause ahead of profits, and that's why I'm proud to partner with them. Patriot Mobile offers dependable nationwide coverage, giving you access to all three major networks, which means you get the same coverage you've been accustomed to without funding the left. When you switch to Patriot Mobile, you're sending the message that you support the First Amendment, the Second Amendment, the sanctity of life, and our military, vets, and first responder heroes. Their 100% U.S.-based customer service team makes switching really easy. Keep your number, keep your phone, or upgrade. Their team will help you find the best plan for your needs. Just go to patriotmobile.com Larry or call 927-PATRIOT. Get free activation when you use the offer code Larry. Join me and make that switch today. patriotmobile.com Larry. That's patriotmobile.com Larry or call 972-PATRIOT. A star of the sitcom Black just claims Trump will put black people in camps if he's reelected and says this mother blanker is Hitler. But there is some good news. She says love is the answer. All right. now, For all you bumpers out there in the big city, all you street people with an ear for the action, I've been asked to relay a request from the Gramercy Ritz. It's a special for the Warriors. That's that real live bunch from Coney. And I do mean the Warriors. Here's a hit with them in mind. We spend half our lives choosing, trying to make a choice on board. What movie tonight? Let me sit here for a half hour. No bombs going off. And we do nothing. We sit on our couches. Oh, I don't believe in voting. You idiot. Mm. If that man gets in, as soon as he takes the oath, he will have generals walk down the steps of the Capitol. Latest sports news off the street, boppers. The baseball furies dropped the ball, made an error. Our friends are on second base and trying to make it all the way home. But the inside word is that the odds are against them. Stay tuned, boppers. Stay tuned. He will take a hammer and break the glass where the Constitution is, and he will tear it up in our faces. Mm. And say, now, I'm the king of the world. 
Jennifer Lewis was featured on an episode of Greed. The guy who was convicted of fraud frauded her. So she's an excellent judge of character, isn't she? All the way back to Coney. You hear me, babies? You will bow down. He will punish everybody that didn't vote for him. Let me tell y'all how I know this. I know it because I know what mental illness looks like. Mm. That mania is unstoppable. All the years come out. See, this mother is Hitler. Mm. He didn't come to play. My goodness. All you can do is pray for her. She obviously has a case of Trump derangement syndrome, except it appears to be more like brain damage. They're coming to take me away, ha-ha, they're coming to take me away, ho-ho, hee-hee, ha-ha, to the funny farm where life is beautiful all the time, and I'll be happy to see those nice young men in their clean white coats, and they're coming to take me away, ha-ha! This mother is Hitler. I mean, not even the nitwits on MSNB Hee Haw have said this about Trump. Maybe someday there'll be a vaccine for Trump derangement syndrome. That mania is unstoppable! And well, since I'm the black face of white supremacy, I guess if Donald Trump gets back into office, I have little to fear. I'm old enough to remember when Hank Williams Jr. got fired from ESPN, owned by the same parent company that produced and distributes Blackish, for comparing Barack Obama to Adolf Hitler. Is Obama available for comment? Go to theepictimes.com and subscribe and sign up for their free newsletter and be sure to check out their new documentary, The Firing Squad. Do you ever wake up and realize your life has no purpose? Do I have a death wish, Morgan asked. Maybe I did. I thought this would be our final run ever. We had made millions and millions of dollars, but God had other plans. The one-time drug dealer turned pastor, along with two others, will be executed at 12 midnight local time. You can be in heaven or you can be in hell. The choice is yours. I found Christ in here and he forgave me. My name is Peter Lone and I will be executed in two hours. Jesus is for free, and salvation is a gift. Do you believe in Jesus? Go to theepictimes.com and subscribe and get on their free mailing list today. Charlemagne the God was not saying this when he interviewed me last year. Now let's move along to uh, Republican Larry Elder. He schooled a hypocrite from the left. He appeared on the Breath Breakfast Club with uh, Charmelaine the God, who had the nerve to question Elder's blackness and whether he needed a wake-up call. Let's have a look at some of the interaction. Have you ever heard of the term a wake-up call? No. It is an incident where a person of color forgets that they are of color and are reminded rather brutally by an unexpected act of racism. Oh, Have you brother. ever had any of oh, those? Oh, brother. Joe Biden insulted you by saying, you ain't really black. We don't know whether or not you want to vote for me or vote for Donald Trump. How dare this guy come in here and insult you, a black man, and tell you, you got to think a certain kind of way. I'm amazed that you weren't mad about that. That should have been a wake-up call on your part to have a white guy come in here who also said, by the way, going to put y'all back in chains. And Joe Biden has lied for decades about his civil rights record, claiming that he desegregated movie theaters and restaurants in in Wilmington, Delaware, when he didn't do any of that. He lied and said that he tried to visit Nelson Mandela during apartheid South Africa. It seemed to me that should have been a wake-up call for you, but it wasn't. Alex, your reaction to that? Well, I'm lucky enough to call Larry Elder a friend, and Larry has a great approach when it comes to this. Sadly, here in America, what we do is we encourage people to play the victim. Larry Elder will never play the victim, and, and hopefully he can shape uh, some young men 
and teach them that playing the victim is not the way that we should live our lives here in America. And of course, there's marginalized communities. Of course, you know, racism, you know, is a thing that happens. But Larry Elder, you know, preaches that we need to rise above it. And with that just small interaction, he woke up uh, Charlemagne to the real reality that Joe Biden does not care about black people. If he really cared about black people, he'd be helping them, but he doesn't help them at all. And he lies mm. about the help that he does supposedly give them. So, you know, what, what happens here in America is that the left uses African-Americans as a pawn in their political scheme and doesn't actually help them. And, you know, Larry Elder is based in reality unlike Charlemagne, who's uneducated and doesn't know a quarter or, a, you know, one eighth of what Larry Elder knows when it comes to, you know, civil rights and civil mm. liberties being trampled on. Now, here's what I mean. After I lit him up, he's been sounding a lot more sensible, even reasonable. This, for example, is what he recently said about DEI. And they're blaming DEI for everything, even that bridge in Baltimore. They called Baltimore's mayor the DEI mayor, like he was given the job for being black. Then they said the shipping company was too focused on DEI instead of safety. But almost the entire leadership of the company is white. <laughs> no black people, right? If anything, the Baltimore mayor, he should have been the one to make it racist. Just come out like, these crackers knocked down my bridge. <laughs> OK? All right? And one of y'all crackers better pay for it. OK? Now, he didn't get it quite right. The correct position, of course, is DEI is just flat out wrong. We ought to be striving for a colorblind society, not a color-coordinated one. But at least Charlemagne understood that DEI is not benefiting the minorities it's supposed to benefit. Hey, little steps for little feet. Hey! Huh. Oh. Why wouldn't you cover that up? A warrior has nothing to be ashamed of. How about you do? Democrats are running on two issues. Trump is a Nazi and abortion is on the ballot. And they're laying out what they think are the tools that they can use right now and then get their extremist courts to yeah. sign off on it. You know, this is why I keep saying, Joy, and I know you do too, abortion is on the ballot in 2024. Mm -hmm. And this is the strongest contrast between Donald Trump, who put this extreme court in place, who helped overturn Roe versus Wade, and Joe Biden and the Democrats who say, you put us in, you, you give us the White House, the Senate, and the House, yeah. and we're going to make Roe versus Wade the law of the land. Now, on abortion, what's Trump's position? Trump says abortion should be left to the states. My view is now that we have abortion where everybody wanted it from a legal standpoint, the states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law of the land, in this case, the law of the state. Many states will be different. Many will have a different number of weeks, or some will have more conservative than others, and that's what they will be. At the end of the day, this is all about the will of the people. You must follow your heart or, in many cases, your religion or your faith. This 50-year battle over Roe v. Wade took it out of the federal hands and brought it into the hearts, minds, and vote of the people in each state it was really something. Now it's up to the states to do the right thing. Like Ronald Reagan, I am strongly in favor of exceptions for rape, incest, and life of the mother. This, by the way, is precisely the position of Antonin Scalia. I'm in the business of enforcing democracy. What, what, what democracy means is that on controversial issues, even stuff like homosexual rights, abortion, whatever, we debate with each other and persuade each other and vote on it, either our representatives or through, through uh, 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 constitutional amendment in the states. We decide the question. Now, there are some exceptions to that in any liberal democracy, and in ours, most of those exceptions are contained in the Bill of Rights. But that Bill of Rights was adopted by the majority, which is why it is proper in a democracy to have a Bill of Rights, because the majority adopted it. Now, when they adopted it, what did they take out of that general principle? What did they take out of that general rule of democracy, that we, we allow open speech, we persuade each other, and we vote? What did they take out of it? They never took out these issues. Abortion, homosexual, content, nobody ever thought 
that they had been included in the, in the rights contained in the Bill of Rights, which is why uh, 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 abortion and homosexual sodomy were criminal for 200 years. Now, whether that's a good idea or a bad is, is not what I'm talking about. That's not my job to say that. It is my job to say whether, whether the Bill of Rights has taken it out of the realm of democratic debate. Well, Just because you feel strongly about it, it isn't necessarily in the Bill of Rights. Now, years ago, USA Today conducted a state-by-state -state analysis on what would happen if Roe v. Wade got overturned. Their analysis? They expected 11 conservative states to immediately pass laws prohibiting abortion. But those conservative states, back then, only had 122 abortion providers in 2000, less than 7% of the nation's then 1,819 abortion providers. Most of those 122 providers, 65, were in Texas. Not much has changed since then. Again, this matter should be left to the states. By the way, I am a co-founder of Old Glory Bank. Get a free copy of my new book, As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save a Nation. Open an account in Old Glory Bank, and when you get your debit card in the mail, activate it, and you will get a free copy of my new book, As Goes California. Just go to oldglorybank.com. That's oldglorybank.com. And the media could not stop cheerleading about Joe Biden's massive $25 million fundraiser. President Biden is in New York tonight with two high-powered friends, Barack Obama and Bill Clinton, for a star-studded campaign event. For $100,000, you can take a picture with the current and former presidents. CBS's Caitlin Huey Burns reports on what could be the biggest fundraiser in presidential campaign history. In New York City tonight, a parade of presidents. Headlining an event at Radio City Music Hall that raked in $25 million. The Biden campaign, which did not allow reporters to record video inside the event, says it raised more than $25 million, a record haul. A star-studded fundraiser at New York's Radio City Music Hall, raising a whopping $26 million in a single night. Okay, Mr. Trump, your serve. Former President Trump setting a new fundraising record with his more than $50 million haul. Former President Trump held his mega donor fundraiser in the state on Saturday night. It was a night for the record books for former President Trump. The campaign and the RNC raised more than $50 million. Damn! According to organizers, his campaign raked in a whopping $50 million at a Palm Beach fundraiser. That's a lot of nuts! Well, it was a Trump's eclipse, I guess, by your, your monologue. Uh, yeah, I mean, it was unbelievable. You know, I've been going to these things for, you know, since Reagan. I've never seen anything like it. You know, everybody's back. Uh, $50 million, as you said, twice what Biden and Clinton and uh, Obama raised together. Um, very enthusiastic uh, people. It was about 100 people at that dinner, a little over. Very appreciative uh, of what Trump and his family, uh, President Trump and his family, are giving up to do this, to save America and make America great again. So uh, the good news is you raised $50 million just to start. All these people are fired up. And second, the small and medium-sized donor also came in with a huge, huge uh, $50 million, another 50. So that's that's, uh, you know, a couple million a day. Pretty good. More money, more money, more money. Hey, records are made to be broken, right? <laughs> this brings us to how to debate a liberal. Nope. Sorry. Kevin Bacon wasn't in Footloose. What? Of course he was. No, he wasn't. You lose. Of course he was. He was the star. Nope, he you're wrong. Look it up. I don't have to look it up. It's common knowledge. Nope. He was on the cover nope. of No nope. People magazine nope. when the movie. Nope. Everyone nope. knows Kevin nope. Bacon was a star nope. of Footloose. No, nope. it was, it was nope. a huge movie. Nope. He was the nope. lead. No, 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 no. One word about the solar eclipse. The scientists and mathematicians can explain everything they want with their numbers and figures, but it's just the feeling and the being there and the emotion and just witnessing something like that that they can't explain. This is what the word unbelievable was made for. Look at it, Justin. Oh my word, look at it with your eyes. Kind of shaking right now. 
unbelievable. You know, we've been hearing about how it's truly a once in a lifetime occurrence and it absolutely lived up to the billing. We just got to totality. There were cheers all around me and it looks beautiful. Back in 1970, I was 3% away from totality, but this time, I, it's hard to explain. Hope you enjoyed our show. Brought to you by my friends at investyrefi.com. Invest in America like I do. And Freedom Chat. Speak freely and message privately with Freedom Chat. And remember, we've got a country to save.